another edition of the Bill of Rights Institute's Close Reads. I'm Kirk Higgins, and I'm really glad that you're joining us today. Uh, for those of you who are new to this program in this format, um, each week uh, or every other week, we find a different primary source that we look at and try to unpack um, to look at different themes and ideas that are sort of prevalent throughout American history. Um, and this week, we're going to be looking at Dwight D. Eisenhower's farewell address. And to help me with unpacking this document, I am fortunate to be joined by Dr. Stephen Toodle. Welcome, Stephen. Nice to be here. Um, Stephen is the professor of history at the College of the Sequoias uh, and is a visiting professor of history at the Ashbrook Center's master program for teachers. Um, and I'm really hoping, because he's done a, a bit of writing on presidents, that he can help me sort of understand a little bit more about what Eisenhower's got going on in this speech. Um, farewell addresses are always really interesting to me because it is sort of that last public pronouncement of a public figure. In, in Dwight D. Eisenhower's case, he had been a public figure um, for a really long time. Um, and so I guess, Stephen, just is sort of to open up our discussion, um, what is it about these, what can we learn, I guess, from presidential farewell addresses? Um, and I guess, why do we have them at all? Is this a tradition that's been around forever? Or is this sort of a thing that's evolved in importance over time? Well, uh, it's a longstanding tradition. George Washington famously gave, set the precedent for giving a uh, farewell address. And um, his farewell address was written by Alexander Hamilton, and Eisenhower explicitly patterned his uh, farewell address on Washington's farewell address um, in that he wanted it to be a sort of a warning about what he was worried, how he was leaving the country and what he was most worried about as he was leaving office. And um, in Eisenhower's case, he actually conceived of his farewell address as being like a, a series of, of um, uh, of addresses, and it ended up coalescing into one um, speech. But Eisenhower took his role as a um, statesman very seriously, and he considered the the one of the things that he was supposed to do as president was uh, um, educate the public on what government was supposed to be doing. And so Eisenhower also was very good about his private thoughts and feelings being made public. And in, uh, what I mean by that is that he was always very consistent. What he was saying in private was always very, very, uh, especially in terms of the broad theories of governance, always matched what he was saying that privately and publicly were always pretty much the same. I mean, you could see in the, like a top secret document, you take the secret stuff out and he was saying exactly the same thing in public. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I, I'm I, I'm really fascinated by that Washington connection because I didn't know about that. But I, I got a lot of sort of Washingtonian uh, uh, vibes from this vibes. Strange word to use. Uh, a lot of Washingtonian um, feelings, though, because he, he does. You see a public official who you know like. Washington was a general beforehand, but you see someone who is retreating from the public eye for the first time and, and trying to be as transparent about that um, as possible. And so I think maybe for me, the big question for this um, is, so, you know, what, what, what do we, what is revealed about Eisenhower's thinking about the executive branch broadly, sort of the role of the presidency, um, you know, through his farewell address? Well, he had a deep sense of history. It's fun. I think in his high school yearbook, he was most likely to be a t history teacher, I think. was, uh, And um, he was primarily influenced by the, the examples of Washington and Lincoln. And he was a very sophisticated reader of, of Lincoln in particular. I mean, really understood the subtleties of leadership and statesmanship um, from, from Lincoln. And... Um, as far as his conception of government, you have to also maybe remember um, why he was why he ran for president in the first place, uh, and that was to restore balance, uh, not to the force, but to uh, the U.S. government. Because after Truman's victory in 1948, he was really concerned that the Republican Party would go away, that the vision of government represented by the Republican Party would go away, and that it would politics would be left on one hand to uh, Democrats and on the other hand to demagogues and he wanted to make sure that that didn't happen so he put himself in this very particular um, historical role uh, when he decided to run for president and then 
his farewell address is a reflection on how or whether he achieved uh, his goals. Uh, so you really get a, you can really get a, a, a pretty keen insight into his philosophy of governance by looking at not just how he conducted himself through uh, eight years in office, but also where he saw his own failings as, as he was leaving office. Great. Well, I think that's a great transition for us to just find out a little bit more about who Dwight D. Eisenhower was. So Dwight D. Eisenhower, we know both as president, but also had a distinguished military career, particularly in World War II, head of the Allied um, forces during the Second World War. So um, Stephen, in your best you know, three minutes, uh, who was Dwight D. Eisenhower um, and how did he end up as president? Um, and, and what were some of the, the sort of the high points of his presidency? Wow. So, uh, gosh, three minutes. Okay, I can do this. The uh, um, born in Abilene, Texas, raised in Kansas, though, and primarily associated with Abilene, um, Kansas. And I'm sorry, he was born in Denison, Texas, raised in Abilene, Kansas, and primarily associated with Abilene, Kansas. Um, went to West Point largely for the free education. His family was pretty poor, and they wanted to find a way so that all the boys could go to college. And uh, he wanted to go to the Naval Academy, but he was too old. Uh, and so he went to West Point. Uh, when he got out of West Point, he made the military a career uh, and rose fairly slowly in the ranks, but had been marked by George Marshall for having a first class mind so that in the case of hostilities ever breaking out again, he would be one of the people who would be uh, first consulted and tapped for a leadership role. So during World War II, he ends up becoming Supreme Ad Allied Commander of all the forces in Europe, and as such, had to deal with all of the political issues of managing that coalition. Um, when he let, when he, um, uh, when the war was over, he was a national hero uh, and known for his, you know great smile and sunny demeanor, but also his, his way of managing people and communicating ideas and um, took over uh, you know, the formation of NATO, served as the president of Columbia University briefly. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, he was a little bit alarmed by Harry Truman's election in 1948. He's one of the few people who was so popular that he could have run for president as either a Republican or a Democrat. And in fact, um, here's an interesting like side note. Uh, for many years, we didn't know who was lying in this story about Truman and Eisenhower, where um, Eisenhower said that Truman had offered to let him run for president in 1948 and Truman would ste step aside and be the vice president. And later on, Truman said, no, that never happened. And so we never knew who was telling the truth. Was Eisenhower telling the truth that Truman had offered him the presidency uh, and the, or was Truman telling the truth? And a few years back um, at the um, Truman Library, they discovered a, an unmarked book that had never been opened or indexed. And it, it was a missing Truman diary from this era. And in that diary, they found that Truman had recorded that, yes, he had offered Eisenhower the presidency. So Eisenhower was telling the truth and Truman was maybe not remembering things accurately. But uh, uh, that's one of those cases where we did actually have a diary, a secret diary, you know, that solved it. Anyway, so he runs for president and he's a tremendously popular. He, uh, he is um, uh, his popularity among two term presidents is uh, almost unparalleled in the, the um, uh, history of modern polling, at least, and uh, s guided by, I'd say, tr the traditional Republican understanding of the office um, with an emphasis on, as I said earlier, restoring some sense of balance to the federal government based on the philosophies of uh, um, individual liberty, protecting economic opportunity, and um, and really protecting America's uh, representative institutions. And so there were major accomplishments during his uh, presidency. Um, the most visible was the interstate highway system, which really revolutionized everything about American life and commerce. It was the largest infrastructure uh, program in American history. So 
it's, it's also useful to point out this traditional dichotomy of people think that Republicans are for small government and Eisenhower never understood it that way. He didn't think of small government, big government. He thought of what, a concept we would call subsidiarity, which is having the appropriate level of government solve the problem. And in the case of how do you build an interstate highway system, only the federal government can do that. So um, again, probably the, the most ha -ha, concrete accomplishment, uh, used a lot of concrete uh, of his administration. Next was starting the space program, which he wanted to start a space program that was in balance with what was possible in the federal budget. So he wanted to have a space program, but he also didn't want to use space. Um, um, to, he, he, didn't, he didn't like the stuff where we're just racing with the Soviets for no reason. Um, and one of the reasons we didn't really develop a lot of intercontinental, uh, we didn't develop a lot of rocket programs for the delivery of nuclear weapons was it was much cheaper and much more accurate to uh, use an all jet air force in, in order to deliver nuclear bombs. And so, um, yes, he created the space program, uh, NASA, um, but in addition, he also created um, a world class um, Air Force capable of um, vast nuclear superiority over the Soviets. Um, next, civil rights. Um, it, it's really remarkable what his civil rights record was in total, especially if you take a step back. A lot of people were frustrated at the time that more wasn't accomplished, but then when you start actually looking at it, you, you realize that it was Eisenhower who actually desegregated the military. Truman had ordered the, the, the desegregation, but never actually did it. And Eisenhower and his staff went through and actually desegregated the military, desegregated Washington, D.C., and desegregated every, every part of the federal government in, that he had um, exclusive power over. Uh, uh, also, um, pro-civil rights attorney general, pro-civil rights solicitor general, pro-civil rights uh, press secretary means that his messaging in regards to civil rights was pretty consistent. So we see Eisenhower, you know, backing the sit-ins, which, you know, that seems maybe a little bit radical, but towards the end of his presidency. Um, but of course, the uh, also managing to appoint pro-civil rights um, justices to the Supreme Court and managing to, um, uh, make sure that the Brown decision would be a unanimous decision um, decided by a pro-civil rights Supreme Court. And the other, I'd say, civil rights thing that he uh, accomplished was probably um, dealing with McCarthy and McCarthyism, um, which it was Dwight Eisenhower who really orchestrated the downfall of Joseph McCarthy. And we now know that Eisenhower was central to um, making sure that McCarthy was marginalized and then um, his political career destroyed. Uh, and then finally, waging the cold, in waging the Cold War, what Eisenhower really hoped to accomplish well, was he completely reoriented American defense posture with the Soviets. Um, Amer at the end of the Truman administration, we were really trying to match the Soviets man for man and outdo the Soviets at what the Soviets were good at. And Eisenhower said, this is foolish. We need to find a way of waging the Cold War without destroying what's great about the United States. And so his national security policy, um, it's in, if you want to do another close read sometime, NSC 162 slash two, maybe less famous than his farewell address, but it really outlines the national security policy of the Eisenhower administration for the next eight years. And he's remarkably consistent. He had already thought deeply about these issues. I'll tell you another Truman Eisenhower contrast. If you look at the two men's diaries from when they became president, on the day that Truman became president, you know, he goes in front of the press and he says, boys, if you pray, pray for me now. He writes in his diary, it felt like a hay bale had hit him over the head. Eisenhower's first day in office, he sits down and writes in his diary and he says, this just feels like a continuation of the issues I've been working on for a long time. I mean, he's one of the few people on earth where the presidency was not the most complicated and difficult thing that he did in his life. Another anecdote from the campaign trail was 
the weather was really bad when he announced his uh, candidacy in, um, in Abilene. And um, he made this kind of offhanded mar remark, like, I haven't worried about the weather since June of 44. You know, like, I mean, what, who cares about what the weather's like when I'm giving my announcement speech compared to making the decision to go on D-Day, you know? Um, so he was one of the people who could really put th the presidency in its historical context because of his study of American history, but also the jobs that he had had before taking office. Yeah, and, and I mean, that record is just tremendous. And it's tremendous to think that this is, you know, this is almost another life beyond what he accomplished during the Second World War. Um, and even the things he was doing during the interwar period, which were which were not insignificant, not as significant, obviously, as what he would do later. But, um, but, but it's, but it's tremendous. And to me, it makes th that context and really appreciating that context, I think, brings to light this speech um, even more, which we can dive right into. And um, I always like starting these things at the beginning, um, which obviously seems like a logical place to start. But oftentimes, and unfortunately, we can only do excerpts because we don't have time to go through the entire speech. Um, but oftentimes, the, the intro gets cut. Um, but I love, I love his intro here because, you know, after... Stephen, you going through that list of things that he's been doing and these accomplishments and these complex things he's been working on, he begins by expressing gratitude to the radio and television networks for providing him with the opportunity, um, you know, to, to, to speak to the nation. And that strikes me as interesting for a couple of reasons. One, because I think it does show in, in a true humility um, that, that I think, again, is reminiscent of sort of a Washingtonian kind of mindset, but it also very much places this in the historical context that it is, right? Television and Television, radio, maybe a little bit, but television as a medium to speak to the entire nation isn't brand new, but it's certainly not, you know, an old hat at this point. It's still a fairly new thing. Um, and so that paragraph really strikes me. Um, and him laying in, you know, laying out what's about to happen in transitioning the office of the presidency, I think is something that we often take for granted in the United States, but that transfer of power being at the center of what it means to move from presidency to presidency and transfers of power between political parties in this case um, it is so critically important that I find it fascinating that those are the two blocks that he begins his speech with. Well, in, it, you're right in that the, the, um, the context for thanking radio and TV is also because we're uh, significant because the 1950s are the decade when televisions became common and the 1960s were the decade when televisions became um, universal. So by the end of the 1950s, the majority of American households did have TVs. That was not true when he took office. It was a very tiny uh, uh, percentage. And it, and it was, wasn't until the 1960s when it became almost universal. So it was Eisenhower who really set a lot of the precedents with regard to how to deal with the TV networks and working closely with them. Um, and, and he wasn't afraid of, uh, he, he believed in communication and mes messaging. So he, he was willing to uh, discuss communication and messaging with uh, professionals and people teased about this saying that this is just like selling soap or something. But, but Eisenhower took those roles seriously. And then with regards to handing it off to President Kennedy, he was very concerned about President Kennedy because he considered Kennedy to be too much of a belligerent cold warrior. And so he, of course he's handing power off to President Kennedy, but um, but he considered he wanted to warn the American people kind of against what Kennedy was pitching. Um, and another interesting contrast is Eisenhower's farewell address, which is warning what we need is balance, and Kennedy's inaugural address, which is saying we don't need any balance at all. We need to bear any burden. Eisenhower's speech is saying, we absolutely do not need to bear any burden. <laughs> we need to balance our many burdens in government. Yeah, and that's a good transition to this next segment um, that we're going to take a look at, which is where I think Eisenhower starts, he, he, do, he doesn't speak directly to that balance that comes a little bit later, but here he begins to lay out um, a direct connection to American history, which I think speaks to his reverence for the importance of history, um, which we've discussed, um, but also he traces here sort of the purpose behind America's intervention um, in, in different uh, engagements throughout the world um, and begins talking about, you know, uses the phrase, the conflict now engulfing the world, right, which, which is that sort of the, the Cold War, I, I think, um, 
and correct me if I'm wrong on that, but but I found these two paragraphs as, as sort of his um, diving into what's going to be sort of the, the substance of his speech to be really powerful in that he frames it in a historical uh, framing, right? So that's sort of the what this is grounded in, and then begins to turn his attention towards um, what what this is going to mean moving forward or what how it is that we can continue to live up to that legacy. Well, there are, I mean, there's so much that's interesting in, uh, in your question and in these first two paragraphs, but um, the first thing I would note is that uh, the 1950s was also the high point for religious practice in America, and Eisenhower always coupled whatever issue he was trying to teach about with religious liberty. And so one of the things that's interesting, if you go back to every time that he mentions religious liberty and civil rights, he always put them together because he knew that Americans already accepted and desired religious liberty. And so he would use that existing belief in order to get Americans on board with civil rights. And so that's a, another good example of how he would use what people already believed in in order to get them to take the next step. And so you see this reference to um, uh, religion and religious liberty in both of these paragraphs. So, so again, what we want to, and we see him saying to enhance liberty, dignity, and integrity among peoples and among nations, uh, and, uh, and to strive for less would be unworthy of a free and religious people. And, uh, and then progress. He, he had this darker view of human nature that, um, that perfection was not possible in government. So he was constantly teaching the American people to strive for progress towards these goals that we'll never actually accomplish. And then we also sometimes think of Eisenhower as being a moderate, but he wasn't a moderate in terms of how he viewed the Soviet Union. Um, he was willing to negotiate with them, but he always understood it as a hostile ideology. And he, um, and he knew the dangers of preaching for security above all else because he's, it's Eisenhower who said, if all you want security, you go to prison. Uh, and, um, but he knew we had to face this, this threat of an aggressive Soviet Union that was trying to take over the world. And, but his point was, we have to face the Soviet threat without losing what's special about the United States. Yeah, and I think you know the, that he categorizes the Soviet Union as atheistic in character. I think speaks directly to to what you were talking about that that's part of the threat um, that he sees facing us. Um, I also, you know, because you had mentioned Kennedy's inaugural address, which follows this, um, this line really jumps out to me. You know, to meet it successfully, there is called for not so much the emotional and transitory sacrifices of crisis, but rather a prolonged and comp or a sorry, but rather those which enable us to carry forward steadily, surely, and without complaint, the burdens of a prolonged and complex struggle with liberty, with liberty, the stake. Um, and that to me speaks to, you know, that that's such a, I don't know, I, it, that's an amazingly complicated thing to try to address to a nation, because I, what I see him saying there is, look, this is going to take sacrifice, but the sacrifice is of such a complex nature that it's not as easy as just you know, of, of just attacking something, right? Like the, the, the immediate, you know, to, um, what's the, what's the phrase, you know, to, to a hammer, everything's a nail kind of a thing, you know, it's, and I think that's kind of a theme that comes through in this speech, but that's a hard thing to try to communicate to the American people, I think. Well, and he, again, as part of what he was trying to teach people was that he, he always um, had this thing where uh, he didn't like it when people talked about how great somebody was as a crisis manager. Because if you're a great crisis manager, that means that you, you're having a bunch of crises. And so, and he always thought it was strange when people would be criticized for making their own jobs look easy. And so this is something that absolutely happened to him where um, for many years, presidential in presidential rankings, people would rank John Kennedy as being this great president as because he was such a great crisis manager and nobody gave Eisenhower any credit even though Eisenhower, his point was like, I, I didn't have a bunch of crises because I was dealing with them before they became a crisis. And it's, it's really insightful of you to note that in this speech because that was a constant frustration that he had. Like crisis makes, you've heard, probably heard this when in regards to law, but people say that cri a crisis makes bad law. And Eisenhower believed that a crisis makes bad policy too. Yeah, and he, he touches on that a little bit 
too um, in, in this next section here, which is a little bit longer, but um, but I think really critical for understanding what he's trying to lay out because he kind of lays out these two two big threats that he th sees facing us. But but he begins this section by talking about um, that that people should be concerned with uh, with the offers of miraculous solutions, um, which is always you know this is something that I I I like to. I always like to listen for when I'm listening to politicians because anybody who's offering me a perfect solution to a complex problem, I tend to be a little bit hesitant of personally um, because these things are complex. And I think um, like you had noted, Eisenhower had been dealing with complex situations for a very long time at this point. Um, and I think this points also to the perfectibility that you mentioned, but that cautioning against miraculous solutions um, to me really stood out. Um, and then here too is where he begins to really speak about that balance, the need to maintain balance in and among national programs, balance between the private and the public economy, balance between cost and hoped for advantage, and balance between the clearly necessary and the comfortably desirable, balance between our essential requirements as a nation and the duties imposed by the nation upon the individual, balance between action of the moment and the national welfare of the future, good judgment seeks balance and progress lacks of it eventually finds imbalance and frustration. Um, There's to me so that, that, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh, well, if, if you had a question, I'll-, I'll No, defer. please, go ahead. Well, I just, there's so much in here uh, that um, that is uh, full of uh, insights into how he viewed the presidency. Um, first is that he understood that you don't have to teach security. You have to teach freedom. People understand. I, I, you know, I want to feel safe, and if, and if you don't feel safe, the temptation for every politician is to simply give you uh, the promise of security, and that, and insecurity is an, a bottomless pit. It's a hole that can never be filled because you can always be made to feel more safe. So what he's doing here is is re-emphasizing balance over and over and over again. Yes, we have legitimate security needs, but we also have to focus on the stuff that is unique and precious and valuable in the American system. Another interesting thing that you that I, I hadn't thought about it until you just brought it up, but the role of um, data in governance. Eisenhower was and Kennedy were right at this um, transition period where computers and data analysis and social science was um, people were advocating for its use in um, governance. And especially if you look at the excitement among liberals in the Kennedy administration about the use of data, saying, oh, we could never do this stuff before because we couldn't process data fast enough. But now that we have these things called computers, we can use that in our economic forecasting and modeling and all this stuff. And Eisenhower resisted all that because he wanted governance to be based on values. Uh, and uh, he was aware of how data could be manipulated. So you see here the, the, this uh, emphasis in the historical value, the historical uh, values of the American system of government and saying, this is what we should be thinking of in um, government decision-making, These the how to balance these values, because the temptation is going to be, now that we have the ability to gather all of this data, we can solve any problem. And he said, this is a temptation we, we should absolutely not fall into. Yeah, and I appreciate too that he's not saying that the pursuance of trying to solve that problem is the problem. He's saying that, you know, it's almost as though having having too much confidence in the fact that we immediately have the absolutely perfect solution, we should dedicate everything we possibly have to that one thing. There's there's uh, a reason to be cautious, um, and I think that's a good transition too to again the most famous part of the speech, talking about the military industrial complex, um, and and what always jumps out to me in this is that it's not it's not as though he is arguing against any sort of, um, you know, mixing of of private industry in the military, um, and and it seems as though he's almost saying, like, look, historically this has changed over time. Um, the way that these arms are produced has changed over time. Part of that's out of necessity, um, but it's a reality that this is now a new thing that we are dealing with, um, and we need to be mindful of that new thing and be vigilant of it. Um, and again, within the context of that balancing, 
which um, to me almost seems like he's looking for that perfect Aristilian mean or, or something. Um, it, it seems to me that he's saying, look, beware of the military industrial complex, but that doesn't mean necessarily um, be afraid of the military or be afraid of big industry or interest in government. What it seems to me he was a warning against was be mindful that there is a potential that this could develop problems within our democratic system. And he had also remembered all the times during his presidency when he had been the one who had prevented uh, military action. Um, and in particular, he was worried about the United States getting involved in a bunch of small wars. So he had a very strict set of rules that he would follow before committing American forces because, and he, I, I think I'm para, I might be paraphrasing, but he kind of said uh, over the years, you know, if you prepare for a bunch of small wars, you're going to end up fighting them. And so he was worried about what would happen if somebody who wasn't Dwight Eisenhower was saying, we don't, we don't want to get involved in these wars. And um, uh, because he knew that the political criticism would be, oh, you're not being tough enough on the Soviets. Um, and um, so it's funny that he gives this warning about the military industrial complex and also its effect on higher education. Uh, and that ends up becoming famous. And after uh, the farewell address, he, he would often express in letters his frustration that, his, uh, the, that people were not looking at the totality of the speech they, and they were only focusing on this one part, you, you know, uh, when part of the speech is about how is about the importance of balance and people would then take this part out of context uh, when he wanted it understood as part of the whole context in the context of the whole speech. Yeah, it's interesting. And again, thinking about our big question again, how is this reflecting his view, you know, as what, what a president ought to do? This educational piece, I think, is an interesting one. Um, and maybe we can touch on that a little bit more. Um, towards the end, but it but it does very much see, feel like he's he's trying to lay out a threat that he is seeing in a public way, so that the public can engage in it in an informed in an informed way that they're paying attention to what he thinks is is critically important. Um, and also too, another thing oh, to mention, yeah, I, yeah. I mentioned that when um, you know how, how he dealt with McCarthy, one of the things that Eisenhower said is, "I won't deal in personalities." So he would only speak in terms of principles of governance, he wouldn't have said, he wouldn't have come out and said, and John Kennedy is what I'm worried about because he said he would never engage in personalities. So he famous, you know, when he was dealing with McCarthy, it, um, you know, he wouldn't say his name, for instance. Um, he would joke privately, for instance, after McCarthy was gone, he said, I think it should be McCarthy was him, which I thought was a pretty good line, but he never said that stuff publicly. He would only say it off the record. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fascinating, right? And I think, again, speaks to, speaks to who he was trying to be as a public official. And, and it's an interesting thing about how one thinks of themselves when they are a public official. I think there's, um, being, being mindful of that, there's a tradition of that in American history, but that, but being mindful of that, that there is a part of you that is public, um, meaning it's owned by the public in a certain sense, I think is, is an interesting concept that sometimes we don't, we don't think about as much as we could. Well, Eisenhower um, thought of himself as being the head of state. Mm -hmm. So, and he didn't think, and it's funny to think about this now because we just expect this behavior from presidents now. But imagine if, if President Biden or President Trump or President Obama had simply never said the names of people who criticized him. You know, we just, I mean, it's just absurd to even think about that as being a, a, a you know, in other words, taking your role as head of state so seriously that you would never, you know, criticize your opponents by name uh, in public. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's such an interesting thing too, because again, looking at, at this passage, because he, even though he is in that position of a head of state here too, you see him using the we pronoun a lot um, and really associating himself as a citizen. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can come Pell, the proper meshing of huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. Um, putting himself in with that, with the American people, um, 
I think is is really interesting. Um, and two, I just want to highlight because you had mentioned this word before, statesmanship, which I think is a, a word that sometimes we see and we're like, oh, okay, yeah, statesmanship. But I think there's a lot to that word. And I think here he's really, it, it feels to me like he's beginning to speak to the next president in this sentence, um, considering himself, we as a part of the public moving forward, but also calling out the need for this statesmanship or you know, the, the role of the head of state guiding the quote ship of state, right, um, towards a right end, um, I think is really interesting. So you had mentioned statesmanship before, so maybe you could think to say a little bit about what, what Eisenhower saw that, what that word may have meant to him and, and how he saw himself as a statesman. Well, he, he absolutely believed that the, the role of leadership was statesmanship. And he would, uh, I think, been pretty comfortable with this, um, uh, this contrast I'm about to uh, tell you, which is, I always find it useful to contrast say, statesmanship with sophistry. Uh, sophistry is the idea that you can tell a lie or a version of the truth in service of a lie. And statesmanship is when you tell a version of the truth that gets people to take the next step towards a larger truth. And if you think of what Eisenhower was doing in this speech, he was saying, I'm giving, you a ver I'm giving you the version of the truth that I think uh, will help you to take the next step that you need to take. And it's, you know, you can sort of turn this over in your mind as you think about the role of a statesman in a, in a representative form of government, uh, which is to say, I'm supposed to be your leader, but I'm also supposed to reflect uh, public opinion. But for Eisenhower, um, what, what he saw as statesmanship is, and it gets back to his vision of um, human nature, is he believed that human beings were infinitely complex. He had seen the horrors of Nazi Germany, for instance, and he, he knew that the worst evils in all of human history had been committed by people who didn't think of themselves as being evil. And so within every human being, you have a nature that's capable of doing evil, but you also have a nature that's capable of doing good. And what a statesman should do is a statesman should encourage the good side of you, if that makes sense. So he knew that the way that you, you could tell if someone was a statesman is a statesman is someone who brings out the good side of America, it brings out the good side and encourages the good side in American po politics and culture and society, uh, using what people already believed in order to get them to be a little bit better. You know, uh, he thought it was good that people were religious. Um, he famously, can we curse in this? I don't, because uh, I can tell an anecdote, but it involves a curse word. But, uh, you know, he famously started his um, cabinet meetings. And he was one of the last presidents to really use the cabinet as an advisory committee, which we can also talk about. But so he started, he wanted to start his cabinet meetings with a prayer. And um, there was one meeting where they had some pressing issue and um, they started the meeting without a prayer. And after a few minutes, Eisenhower turns to John Foster Dulles, who was his secretary of state and says, God damn it, Foster, we forgot the prayer. You know, I, so he, he was, uh, uh, he also said something kind of like, um, uh, everyone should have a religion and I don't care what it is. <laughs> so so uh, uh, he knew that people had um, various beliefs about faith and that he wanted to be able to build on those things in order to encourage the good part of their nature. So you can sort of see in this, it's the task of statesmanship to mold, balance, and integrate these and other forces new and old within the principles of our democratic system, ever aiming toward the supreme goals of, of our free society. Um, in, in a way, he's kind of summarizing everything I just said. Well, Stephen, thank you again. Um, and we'll be sure and share the Eisenhower Library's um, email link in the description as well. So if you want to check out this document or other documents that they have, um, you can get the whole um, the, the whole collection that Stephen was just mentioning. Um, but Stephen, it was a lot of fun walking through this with you, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Absolutely. Love talking to you. Absolutely. And thank you all again for joining. Um,
please do like and subscribe uh, to the video if you haven't and you want to get more content. Um, we cover not only primary sources, but we have other great conversations with scholars like Stephen, um, with my colleague Tony Williams. We also look at different um, image-based primary sources um, with my colleague Mary Patterson. Um, we also have more pedagogically focused videos um, and all kinds of stuff going on um, every week here at the Bill of Rights Institute. So please let us know um, if you want to reach out to us and be in touch. Uh, feel free to leave a comment or reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Uh, and until next time, thank you so much.